after this in the coffee break. But um, if, if more questions or they, they work more one of the examples co sample codes, just or you have other yeah other questions, just send me an email. I'm, very, I'm usually a little bit slow in answering emails, but uh, I will answer them. I'm very well known to be very slow email answer, but eventually I will answer them, maybe with a long answer. All right. I also I finally have done homework. And I've, maybe it's already on the web page. So I put all the slides for the web page, but I also prepared some more example codes, and that's why you see this thing here. Um, because so now, so I'm a slow email answer, but I'm even a slower code documenter. I have to say. So uh, the code isn't very well documented, but I think, um, you can work through it. So now here, this is basically, I, I'm not sure how, whether, whether he will put um, a zip file or he will put the, the individual codes. So anyway, so there's going to be this, this, all these PDF files uh, for the slides. That there's going to there's gonna be some Python codes, OK? Essentially, there, there are three examples. There's the advection equation, the wave equation, uh, and both of them, so they use this method of lines. And so there, there's a, a code which implements the method of lines, which is called mole base, method of lines base, and ODE base. So this, is, well, this is for general ODE equations. For, um, and then there is wave equation mole and advection equation mole, and they use this, this one. Okay? It's like two things together. One has all the Runge Kutta and so on, the other has basically just the equations you need for the wave equation. There's also a directory with TOV for the TOV equation for in spherical symmetry to have a a star in, in equilibrium. There's a simple Python-based one here. And then in, the, in this directory, you find more tutorials. And you find some Fortran 90 code to solve the TOV, TV equation. In fact, you find two of them. There's, a, there's one which is just a TOV equation. And then one which, which uses basically the mole method of lines. And you can, you can use this to do general um, Partial differential equations in with the method of lines. Uh, it's, it's not really documented, but there's a the code is not much, much documented, but it's a tutorial for these things. So I think it's in principle feasible to use this, and you have some you know Fortran 90 code if you'd like that actually does something. It, it's uh, and you have some uh, Python codes for the kinds of things that we discussed. Uh, the Python codes, if you want to use them, then you have to install all kinds of extra Python Python packages like matplotlib and things like this. And that can be very entertaining, but yeah, that's what you have to do. Now, um, what else? So now, where's my, where is the, so now we'll have to go through three, three slides of slides. So I need to start with this one. No, I'm screwing up, I have to start with this one. All right, so yes, as I want, just want to finish the argument from yesterday, and then we go on to other things. So yesterday I was, um, I had drawn this, what do we have? We have to draw this Penrose diagram from the Schwarzschild space time. Here it is. Um, the past isn't really that important. So here is our event horizon, which are now surfaces. And then let's just uh, remember again what actually the Schwarzschild metric looks like, that line element. So uh, minus in Schwarzschild. Uh, coordinates, 1 minus 2m over r dt squared plus dr squared divided by the same factor, 1 minus 2m over r plus r squared. Um, the theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. So now, so the, 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 the phi coordinate, everything is uh, also actually symmetric, that's the least boring one, so you don't have to usually uh, consider this. And so now we've said that, so we, so we have some, consider some numerical relativity evolution. Maybe we started with some slice like this. And so the slice has this wormhole topology that we have already discussed, like that. Um, so it has two asymptotically flat ends, right? Two asymptotically flat region, the one where you are, right? You are here. And then there's another one which is inside, so there's this minimal surface, this is where your horizon is, and there's another whole infinity inside, okay? And we describe this by this conformal factor, which goes like one plus uh, something divided by, sorry, r. 
and so this one over r, so sorry, r equals zero, this is basically the center here. So this goes up, and it goes up in such a way to, right, why, why do we have, why, why does this, uh, why this uh, psi, let's, let's do this again, so here, my metric, my physical metric was three metrics on H, A, B is psi for H bar A, B, and in fact, this one here, this is just flat, Kronika delta, flat metric. So why, if we have this kind of shape, why does the psi has to blow up? Well, in a flat metric, all the distances, they will be finite. If I have, if I have a finite, right, if I, if, I, if I make a picture of this, let's say, in X and Y in space, like here, that's my, there is this hole that goes inside, right? So from this point in X, for example, to, to this point here, which is down, down here, it's a large separation. If you compute the, pro the proper separation, it's very large. Right, so if I compute the proper separation with this metric, it's not very large, it doesn't go to infinity. So this thing of, there's an infinite amount of space here, this has to be captured by some function, it's this one here, this one is blowing up, there's an infinite amount of space. And this one of our singularity just has exactly the right form to give you this. All right, um, so now we, so this is what our initial data looked like. And so we continue to evolve, then we'll get the same, we'll get the same kind of topology. Um, and now we, we make a relativity evolution, we'll see that initially there may be some dyma dynamics, but now our slice looks comp perfectly time independent. Everything has settled down just as it should be, okay? Because it's a, the, the, so the final solution is a Schwarzschild black hole or a Kerr black hole. It's physically time independent. So the coordinates that we use it should also make the two components look manifestly time independent. And so we'll evolve this and we see actually it works. Okay? So our, our, core, our gauge conditions for the lapse and the shift, they are indeed uh, what we call three findings. So they, they adapt themselves somehow automatically to the time independence and the proper axial symmetry, okay? That's how they are designed, and that's what they're doing for us. So, so now we, we, have some, we have some slides, which it enters, we enter the black hole somehow, and we see that it's, it looks independent, but what, 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 what happens to this? We, I told you this yesterday, so if you compute, you take your, time-like vector, the vector that the grid point follows, like a d by dt basis vector, and, oops, mistake uh, yesterday, you will find that at the horizon this is zero, okay? Um, so here, this is time-like, here this vector is time-like outside, because t is a time-like coordinate, so here this is going to be smaller than zero, here it's going to be zero, here is larger than zero because it's space-like. If, if the slice goes out all the way, it would be zero again, and then it would again be smaller than zero. But you do this in your nuclear evolution, you see it's zero, then larger than zero, larger than zero all the way. Okay? So what happened to this? Well, we have said that um, we use this uh, slice condition, the lapse condition, which makes a slice in so there's going to be some some uh, min some some distance we can't go closer than the singularity than that. Okay. Now if you go back to our interpretation of uh, Schwarzschild coordinates, if you if you set so this is this is a spatial slice inside our slice. Okay. So inside the spatial coordinate is t. So if t equals constant, then we have a three geometry, which is this term plus this terms, right? And we see that nothing depends on time. So, so, so but it is a killing vector also inside, but now inside is a spatial vector. So, um, so what is this geometry, right? This is the metric of a sphere. Let's draw this sphere. This is one of these spheres with a particular value of r. This, let's see, this is the sphere at value r1. At value r2, sorry, um, <laughs> that's not, <laughs> the spatial, sorry, the sp I get confused, the spatial coordinate is t, right? 
look at a spatial slice. So this is at spatial coordinate T1. At spatial coordinate T2, we have the same sphere because nothing depends on T. So this is some kind of cylinder. And in fact, it's an infinitely long cylinder. Okay? So R equals constant. R equals, co R equals constant outside is a sphere. When you vary theta and phi, it's a sphere. Okay? But inside, it's an infinitely long cylinder. So that's something different. Uh, Usually for astrophysical purposes, you say, I don't care what's inside of the black hole. If I go there, I can't get out. But if you have to simulate the whole space-time, you have to know a little bit about the inside of the horizon. And that, well, it turns out that inside, there's an infinite amount of space. Okay? And this has this kind of cylindric geometry. It's completely different than in the outside. All right? And so what... what, what um, what your slice is doing now, it just becomes asymptotic to that, and it looks like this. Okay? Essentially, what, the way that you can imagine this, what, what people thought would happen, is that, that as you move forward in time, this kind of embedding diagram, in fact, gets longer and longer, like spaghetti. Okay? In fact, we call it the spaghettification. The same thing that's happened if you fall into a black hole, right, because the, uh, the um, tidal forces stronger, let's say, at your legs. If you go head, leg first, the tidal forces are strong at the leg than in the head, so you are stretched apart like spaghetti. But the same thing kind of happens to your coordinates. So this, this diagram just gets stretched out like spaghetti. Okay? And in fact, so this, this middle part, it gets stretched out to infinity. All right? All the way to infinity. It gets infinitely long. It gets stretched out all the way up to here which is at infinity, which is like this infinitely sp infinite space inside of the Schwarzschild black hole. There's another copy of this, which would basically go from here to there, but uh, in our choice of coordinates, you, don't, you wouldn't see this very much. Okay, so this kind of thing gets stretched out to infinity, and then it like rips into two parts. One part is this, goes from here to here, and another part is this from here to here. But since this is already at infinity, it gets basically disconnected from your simulation. So now your simulation, only includes this part, which goes all the way to infinity. So now your spatial slice looks like, the, if you make an embedding diagram, it looks like kind of this, and it becomes like infinitely long, like a cylinder, okay? Which people call this a trumpet. Okay, trumpet. All right, now, now because, so this thing is gonna be less singular, okay? Here we had 1 over r. This is the right singularity for the whole thing blowing up again. The conformal fact that it describes this thing here, it also goes asymptotically like 1. But it has to be blowing up less. It has to blow up a little bit. This is an infinite distance, but it's larger again. Okay? So it has to like blow up only half. And so for this reason, this goes like something divided by square root of r. Okay, which is less singular. And so, so that's an important part of, of why it didn't work when you factor out one over r, and why it works if you don't factor out anything, because the actual singularity is much milder, and you can just evolve this. And you don't even have to factor it out, it's just fine. All right. Um, there's another curiosity. All right, let's not go this. There's another nice curiosity, which has to do with uh, coordinates. So this is uh, um, this is this is what this this is what these in spirals look like, right? Nice, nice shapes that these black holes make. And so it is and say that's exactly what it's supposed to look like. Why not? But the thing is that in general relativity, your co your coordinates are in some sense completely arbitrary. In fact, if you if you look at the angle, you find exactly. Um, the angle of velocity, which is like half of the gravitational wave frequency. Okay, there's a, a priori, there's no reason why these things should should go this way. All right, it's it's a big miracle. But in fact, it's not a miracle because the thing is, if if you if your simulation works, your simulation is only going to work if your coordinates find these symmetries in this basically singular space time. And if they adapt to the symmetries and make your solution simple, okay? If you have two objects going around each other, like you know, a space-time diagram, 
in a space-time diagram, like one goes like this, and the other one is going to go. Well, the, the other one, you imagine, okay? They go around each other, all right? So now, you, if, if, they, if they don't shrink together, approximately, they just do this spiral, then, of course, so basically, if you move with the object, nothing changes as you co-rotate with the object, okay? So things, so this uh, space-time is not time in But if you move with the object, Okay, so there's a killing vector associated with this kind of symmetry, and this is called a helical killing vector. Okay, helical. It's with one L, variety with two L. They have spent a lot of time on this, that's why it's with two L. Um, so basically, if you have a good coordinate system, then your coordinates they will find this helical vector. And so, so a helical killing vector is defined up to a rigid rotation, okay? A fixed rigid rotation. And so your rigid rotation at infinity because that's how you set your initial data. And so actually any uh, numerical simulation binary that actually works well, because the binding that had to work well has to find, find a helical killing vector, it has to fit with the right frequency. Okay, otherwise it probably wouldn't work well. All right. So this was. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this kind of geometry. How, you know, how computational big computations, how they are connected with some geometry in GR. And now I want to switch gears completely and talk about a bit of computational infrastructure. Okay. How, how does this work? All right. So now, some of so some some slides are going to be now very kind of practical, and some slides are going to be very. Because this is one of the philosophies. So let's think a little bit about the cost and the error. So you write some code. You, you want that the errors are small, but it should also be affordable to write this code. Yeah, the finding your error, finding your errors, your bug takes a long time. So what? So what to do? Um, there's this. This I, I highly recommend this to read this book. It's a, it's a very old book. And it's called the mythical man month. Okay, it, talk, it talks basically. It talks about some guy that I think he worked for IBM, and they had this project, and the project failed completely. Okay, they thought they had some time, and it, it, it didn't finish. And it was just a total disaster. And so, and so, you know, how in software projects things can take much. Time to think what are all the problems that you have. Um, Recommend this. This is this is what what the picture one doesn't see very well. I think it, it's some um, what are bears or dinosaurs or something, which the animals their bones, they, they fall into some tar pit, and then it's conserved for millions of years. But they just get stuck in the tar. And so so these big software projects often they're like the same. Things get very complicated and viscous, and you just die. All right. This is what we avoided. So good book. Um, all right. So we want, in particular, maybe an approximate solution to partial differential equation with some error estimate at an affordable cost. And so um, the, the, the cost that you can afford. And so there are different costs. So for example, in, in the running the code, that's what most people think of. But also, of course, uh, in developing it, and then maybe in modifying the code for new problems. This is one of the nice things about this method of lines. You write the code in such a way that it solves a general method of lines problem. Okay. You use it to you to study some physics problem uh, that you're interested in, maybe the wave equation. But then your advisor or somebody or you come and says, ah, if you just had <laughs> this nonlinear term, it would be so much more interesting. Or you study this now on the background of a different metric. Okay. And then the important thing is is it easy for you to modify your code? Or is this like a whole new is it is it maybe taking you two hours? Because you have modularized, you have found what's the right mathematical structure. Okay, and, and you just have to change a little coefficient here, and it's an entirely new problem, or you do have to rethink completely your code from the ground up. If you're more flexible, you can write tech science problems more easily, you can write more papers. Um, all right. Then you also have to be also, also more accurate, which is always better, kind of, but you, have, you don't, um, you don't, 
strange than your accuracy than what you really, really need, because getting more accuracy is maybe more, very expensive, and your cost in running, developing, and so on is maybe spent better uh, somewhere else. Um, on the other hand, I think it's very important that you don't spend a lot of time trying to uh, interpret very poor numerical data. Okay. You have some code. It's not a very good method. Data are not, they're very noisy. They're just very, very poor. Okay. Maybe, I mean, I, I come from, speak from, maybe you spend years and years trying to get some information out of this very noisy, crappy data. Maybe it's just better to spend some time, if you can afford it, to just write better code. Okay. There are another, another, there's another obsession. Uh, some people are obsessed with machine accuracy. Okay. This is sometimes you actually have to go beyond machine accuracy. You have to reach machine accuracy and go beyond. That happens very rarely. Uh, usually, this is not something that's very healthy to be uh, obsessed. With. Um, something um, about computational cost. For some big problems, you need a really, really big machine. Okay, you may not have access to a big machine. I think, as a general rule, if you have a good idea and a working code, often, not always, often, the computer time will come to you. Okay, maybe you find a collaborator that has a lot of computer time and they, they really like your idea and they're happy to work with you. Uh, I think the so computer time is difficult. Uh, to get, but really much more have a really good idea. If you have a really good idea, I think the time is going to come to you. Um, all right. What else? Um, yeah. You, you, you will find out that most of the time, most of your time is maybe spent on debugging your code uh, or, or trying to figure out what the hell is going on when your data are poor. So you try to, you want to really, if you want to be more efficient, Try to be very careful about how to do things so that, that this time is uh, minimized. That's so one very good strategy is defensive programming. Okay, defensive programming is like defensive driving. Assume that things may go wrong, that somebody doesn't see your car. Just be very careful and you know, avoid, avoid problems early. Uh, so you can read this kind of thing. So defensive programming, very, very um, important. And one of the main uh, things to be defensive in programming is just keep it simple, okay? If you're try to, for example, often if you look for a uh, mistake in your code, you have to read all your code, you're not going to find a mistake. Try to, sometimes, you know, you find a difference code, there are these grid array as is a function of i plus one and j minus one and so on. If you make it tight, you're not going to find it. But if you, if you nicely write your code, very nicely aligned, so just by, if, you, if you've forgotten the plus one in some line, you know, your whole line is in by one. And just don't even read it. You just see oh, something is wrong with this line because it's just not aligned. Okay? This can be very important to find mistakes. Um, keep, keep it really simple. If you um, have this great idea of how you write this code, if you, if you, yes, there will be the day where you come home, you've had three beers, or you thought, I'll just make this little change. But at that moment, this code is really too compl complicated for you. Keep it simple. So it's always easy to understand for you and for others what is going on. Um, I think I, I talked about this already in the colloquium, that uh, binary um, problems, black hole problems, they really have very uh, different scales. And so you need mesh refinement to uh, resolve all these different scales, and metric refinement is really a big complication in your coding. And so I'll also, oh yeah, this, I have a movie. All right, the, the movie has some, there's some, she was reading the data, that's why it uh, slips at some point. Should switch this off, I guess. It's just, it's just I, I added, one of my students did that one. And you can really see that there, there's, uh, there are regions that they really need a lot of refinement because you have this kind features and so the white dots are the black holes but this is all where the black holes are orbiting so in fact waves they have a much much larger scale and we have to resolve those also and so now we're zooming in to resolve the waves as they go out so this is not you see all these grids here very very different grids and then we saw so zoom out to see the whole computational domain where we track these waves as they go far away and resolve the boundary conditions let's see 
You see that this is the this is the actual binary. Just now this uh, after the merge is very very small. And now we go out much further, and we see what the actual computational was this simulation. So in, in general, for example, you will spend all, all your computer time is spent on the fine details of the binary, but all your memory usually is spent on these auto grids. There are, there are methods to to do much better that I haven't talked about, but they come usually with their own problems. Um, all right. What what do I really want to say about? So mesh refinement, usually adaptive mesh refinement, AMR. Uh, so it really makes your code a lot more complex. There is for us, uh, there is uh, for me, uh, there is some good news that for compact binaries, usually you don't need the most adaptive mesh refinement because your mesh refinement is basically you have to you have to use more resolution where the black holes are. And you know, I mean, it's not very complicated. They're just moving around like this. You know where they are, okay? Your, your mesh is simply follow the black holes. And this is also often called fixed mesh refinement because you know exactly what to do. It's not, not that suddenly, you know, in the middle of the black hole, somewhere some exciting event happens and suddenly you need more refinement there. Okay, it's, it's very predictable where you need more resolution. And this makes the associated computer algorithms much, 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 much simpler. Um, okay. One of the, one of the big complications of the whole game that you're already aware of is that there's a relation between the, the grid spacing delta x and the time spacing delta t. This is correct. If your delta x is smaller, your delta t is also smaller. Okay? Um, if you just have to refine in, in space, it's not too much of a problem, but you also have to refine in time, which I think we see on the next slide. Right. So there's some Berger oligar mesh refinement, but we usually in general relativity it's not exactly Berger oligar mesh refinement, but the basic idea is the same. So so imagine you so this is your initial data, this is t equals zero, and this is your fine grid, this is your coarse grid. Okay? Usually for sim so for simplicity, the ratio of delta x between this grid and this grid is always a factor of two, which means the ratio of the delta t's is also a factor of two. So when the coarse grid makes one step, the fine grid has to make two steps. Right, but now uh, maybe what? Maybe one of the things that you learned, if you tried the uh, wave equation exercise, is that if you want to take the derivatives at the boundary, so here, this is the boundary of the fine grid. You take a derivative. Let's say second order. So for this one, second order, you take this point and this point to compute the derivative. But for this point, what you do? It doesn't have a neighbor. Okay. Uh, if usually. Um, you would get this information by a physical boundary condition, like maybe periodic boundaries or whatever it is. But in this case, here there's no, there's no real physical boundary condition. You have to get the information from the course grid. It has already made one step. So you have to communicate information between the different grids. For example, the different ways. So for example, you make a step of the course grid, then you interpolate to the middle in time and space. And then you fill the information that you need for the fine grid. Okay, that's what is done very often. Problem: one of the big problems is this. So you also you call this uh, buffer points, basically extra points that you uh, include in order to have enough uh, width of your numerical stencil to compute your derivatives. Problem is, so this is if you if you have second order. Uh, you need one extra point, but but if you have higher order, you need more points. Okay. So also, so this kind of interpolation, this is uh, second order accurate. So I'm, I want to have a super accurate simulation. I use sixth or eighth order finite differencing here, and then I, this is only second order accurate. Okay. So then what you can do is you have a lot more buffer po points as many buffer points to store all the information that you need during this update. All right, but that's a lot of buffer points. So for example, if you have Runge Kutta 4, which has four individual, um, four, in, four individual evaluations of the right-hand side for the fine grid, so four here, four there, and then multiplied with the, with the, with the um, stencil size, you would need 32 buffer points on each side of the grid. That's very expensive. Sometimes we have to do this, but most of the computational cost goes into 
manipulating your buffer points. Um, all right. There's a number of there's a number of alternative methods to finite differencing, which I wanted to mention that they have their advantages and sometimes maybe also disadvantages. Um, and so one big class of these methods is what's called uh, spectral methods. And spectral methods, um, you can view them from from different angles. That makes makes them somehow simple, I think, to understand. Is you can say, all right, I have my grid. What's the highest finite differencing order which I can apply in this grid? I could do second order, fourth order, and so on. My stencil gets wider and wider. Well, uh, I could also use basically all the points which I have in the grid. Okay, I don't have a 32 point grid. I use all my 32 points. I, I refine my grid. I have half the delta x resolution. I have 64 cube points. And now I use all 64 points in my um, finite difference stencil. Okay, I could do that. And essentially, and this is essentially what you do. When you do spectral methods, that your your finite difference stencil gets higher, higher order as you refine the grid. So in this case, if you would make a convergence test, you would find that it doesn't uh, that your accuracy doesn't converge with a fixed order, second order, fourth order, whatever it may be, but it will essentially uh, converge faster than any polynomial, so exponentially. Okay, that's a nice feature because the convergence order is much, much, much faster. Um, all right, uh, you can also view this the way it's usually uh, presented. You say, well, I, it's, it's the same, it's the same result, but a different interpretation. That I don't uh, view this as just taking finite differences, which have the width of the whole grid. But in fact, I, I, I simply expand my solution in terms of some basis functions, which are defined across uh, the whole grid. Uh, you, this, this whole idea of using a basis function instead of some local Taylor series, you can do this in a systematic way. You say, OK, I have some finite have some solution that I'm looking for. I have some finite dimensional space in which I do this. This is my partial differential equation. With this L is my um, uh, differential operator, and then I say, okay, what is my error? My error or residual is simply the, the operator applied to the solution minus the correct answer. And then I can say, all right, um, how, how do I now test what my residual is and what do I do about it? Then you can, you can choose some expansion functions, also called trial functions, so that there's going to be some basis of how you expand your functions, and then Right, so this is how you this is how you expand your solution. So you say this is my solution, and then here there are some coefficients, could be four coefficients, for example, and then here there's my basis functions which depend on where I am in my space X. And then I have some other types of functions which are called test functions. These can be different functions, and these functions are used to see to check how small my residual is. Okay? So in order to have this kind of discretization, I need, I need some basis functions. I need other functions to check how, how, how small is my residual. This is a very, very picture. And now you can get different methods with very different behavior depending on what you choose for your expansion or trial functions and what you choose for your test functions. And so you can classify methods now in this way by uh, what are your trial functions. So first of all, find a difference is, what are your trial functions? It's just overlapping low, local polynomials, typical of some low order, second, fourth order, sixth order, and so on. Uh, the finite element, or spectral, for example, with the trial functions, is just a complete basis of global smooth functions. If you have something like periodic boundary conditions, uh, very appropriate would be a Fourier series if you don't have periodic functions, there are different choices, but the most, by far, the most popular is to use these expansion Chebyshev polynomials. And they usually, they, what, what, uh, they go together with a particular grid, which are basically the nodes of the Chebyshev polynomials, and they have the nice feature that essentially they get finer 
where you have your boundaries. Okay? You can all, in fact, you can use this also for finite difference um, problems, and sometimes this is, this is useful to, to use a finite difference, sorry, to use a Chebyshev grid, even if you do finite difference. Um, that is another classification, which is, uh, depending on what are your test functions, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, most used spectral method, I would say, is this, this thing is called collocation or pseudo-spectral method. And so here, here, test functions are basically delta functions at some specially chosen points that you choose wisely. For example, these Chebyshev nodes. And so the idea is that you in your calculation, you use both the spectral grid and your physical space grid. And so you compute derivatives in the spectral representation. So if, you, if I, you know, if you make Fourier transform computing, a derivative is very convenient and very fast and very accurate because you use the whole basis. All right? Uh, it's, it's like using points in a finite difference formula across the whole grid. But if you evaluate nonlinear terms, for example, in your source terms, there's a u squared, solution squared. If you have to compute the square of a, of, of a spectral expansion, you have to com multiply every element with every other element. That is super expensive. So if you evaluate this kind of, uh, if you evaluate your square, for example, or some other, other nonlinear function, then, because it's expensive in Fourier space, uh, you just do this in the physical space. Then you say you have this grid, which is called your grid of collocation points, where you check your solution, and then and this is computed on this in physical space on your fixed um, fixed uh, collocation grid. There's another class of methods which are called Galerkin methods, which are currently extremely getting very, very, very popular in numerical relativity, which have um, the different flavors again. Um, and so here your, your test functions are the trial functions, and then each of those functions, they, they each by itself satisfies the boundary conditions. This is this is also very useful. If have solutions with are which are not smooth, like in computational hydrodynamics, but where you still want a high, very high order of convergence. Uh, so we want a very high accuracy for solutions which are not smooth. This is currently what is very, very, very uh, popular in numerical uh, relativity. I think, in the interest of maybe I don't go too much more in detail here. This is this typical grid in two dimensions of these Chebyshev points. So you see how the how the density of grid points piles up near the boundary of your computational domain. This is all. This can also be very useful if you don't solve partial differential partial differential equations at all, but maybe you want to make a fit. Like right, what we do, for example, with uh, fitting some waveform model to numerical data. Uh, usually, it's always uh, you always have a lot of trouble of adapting things to the boundary, and many of these problems sometimes can be solved by just putting more points to the boundary. There's basically, uh, you know, these problems from um, Fourier analysis, that on the boundary of your Fourier line, you can, can get these overshoots and high frequency oscillations. And so just having more points close to the boundary usually um, makes these problems much, much smaller. All right, then, so another thing that is uh, extremely popular for people is finite elements methods. In fact, probably for all, all the methods that are used for partial differential equations, maybe this is the most popular. And the reason is because, it's, because people like this preferred in technology. And so this is because it's, it's tailored for very complicated um, geometries. If you want to do finite difference methods, and even worse for spectral methods, for a very complicated geometry, like uh, airplane, uh, geograph geographical things, certain things that that you arrive in engineering. The main problem is not that usually that, you're, that the equation is very complicated, but your boundary conditions, your geometry is very complicated. And so these are the ones. These methods are the ones which are most easy to adapt to complicated uh, boundaries. And so that there's a there's a whole there's an immense amount of numerical codes available that are used in all kinds of technological applications. There's, there's every few years, somebody uses um, these methods, or maybe even a, a fixed package, to do in our simulations. I think so far hasn't really taken over, except, so at, at least for time evolution, for, for initial data is a bit different. But uh, it's also something interesting, because there's, this is the very, very mature methods uh, exist, and people like to play with that. 
Um, another very different method uh, is called the finite volume method. And this is something that I'm sure Luis Lena is going to talk about a lot next week, because this is one of the methods which are used to fluids, which have non-smooth solutions. And so you can have a look at this slide, but I'll leave it to Luis to uh, tell you all about these methods next week. Um, another thing that people always get very excited about is very special hardware, like uh, GPUs, for example. I think this, this slide, I did it. I did it five years ago. I checked check the slide. I think it, it still applies. There's, there hasn't been much. Uh, I think so. They, they are faster now, and uh, and they have more memory. But there hasn't been a huge uh, a huge development. So so GPUs can do certain certain operations extremely fast, and they have a very very high degree of parallelism. So they can do certain certain operations. They can do a thousand of them at the same time, very very fast. So if this if this uh, fits together with your workflow, they can they can really be very very fast, and and this workflow has originally come up essentially in computer graphics, so computer graphics for video games, uh, which uh, is a big market, and so uh, this has reached a lot of um, a lot of sophistication of having this. Uh, so 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 basically, I've, I've, you know, as you know, video games are basically very uh, sophisticated physics simulations. Okay, um, and, so, and so the hardware that is developed for this is actually can be quite useful for physics. The, the the problem is that these things can be a bit hard to program because you have to essentially transfer information, the data between the between the CPU and the GPU and back. And then what what happens very often is that this is the main uh, bottleneck, and this can be quite complicated. On the other hand, now you can, for example, this for certain so both, for example, both MATLAB, Mathematica, they have quite nice uh, GPU support, and so um, using this kind of software, we may actually be quite relatively simple for certain types of calculations to um, to get some benefit of of GPUs, and it's also very successful in particular for problems with smaller memory requirements. So for this Kolsky equation, which I mentioned several times, uh, the equation for black hole perturbations equation than the Einstein equations and is quite well suited to GPUs and there's the codes that evolve the, the Kolsky equation extremely efficiently on GPUs. All right. Now I'm now going to do some calculations of what all the what all this fun really costs. So let's see. Um, because now, now there's a lot of general Comments. Now let's let's do a few little calculations just to get an estimate on what are the scales, how expensive are these calculations. So let's remember. Um, so if you do things in 3D, in in 1D, things are not very expensive. We may not care too much about the cost. So in 3D, what does it what what does it cost to refine the grid? Well, if you if you make delta x smaller, usually you have to make delta t smaller by the same amount. Uh, and so now the, the overall cost basically goes like delta x to the minus 3, delta t to the minus 1, which basically delta x to the minus 4. Okay? So, it, so that the computational cost, if you make it, if you increase the resolution by a factor of 2, costs you 16 times as much. All right? If you have a higher dimensional problem, which is very relevant, uh, for example, if you, use, if you have to solve the Boltzmann equation for radiation transport, it has six dimensions, the whole thing is a lot worse. Um, all right. Um, so now, what do I say? Um, so now if you want to, if you want to estimate the error, we have discussed the the convergence. So we have a a convergence series like this. We assume that just maybe the error, the first term here, contributes the error. That we need three resolutions to determine the best guess of the solution, the error term here, and the order of convergence. Uh, we have discussed that basically what you do is you first check whether n is consistent with your algorithm, and then once you have convinced yourself that uh, that that's okay, you have fourth order convergence theoretically. The n is about four, then you can proceed to compute your uh, best guess x zero, and then also an, an error estimate, for example, x zero minus the best so this estimate minus the best resolution. Uh, now, for example, three D, it's, it's it's nice to consider what what's kind of the even point in cost, okay? 
So if, if this order is n, then so if this <laughs> if this order n is four, then if you make a resolution twice as good, it costs 16 times as much, but also the error goes down by a factor 16. So that's the kind of the break even. So if you if you ha if you if your if your error if your convergence rate is less than four, you really get a bad deal. And if you have larger than four, then you get a much better deal. So usually people use uh, six order, 10 not so much, for numerical relativity simulations or spectral, because that's where you get a good deal. One of the problems with this, that you may actually, if you solve the wave equation, you do a convergence test, you may find a mild um, example of this. Let's say you, you solve your wave equation second order Space, but you use wrong code four, which is fourth order accurate. Well, they have no, you have you don't have just one convergence order in your code. You have two. All right, you have you have one leading order term from the wrong code and a leading order term from the spatial discretization, and they may not even have the same sign. So they could cancel each other, and then inter interpreting the result is complicated. <laughs> For example, if you if you if uh, you can afford it, like you can afford if you do your wave equation example or something similar in one dimension, the the, the best thing is to use a consistent convergence order. So use, for example, runge kutta four and four for the final differencing. Then you have a consistent order. All right. In typically in numerical relativity, we can't afford any ac any accuracy which we can get. And we use runge kutta four with higher order final differencing. And sometimes we use it with uh, this uh, time interpolation of refinement we just saw, bef we just saw before, which is the second order. And sometimes if we use dissipation not at the right order, and so we have three, four terms that sometimes cancel each other out. All right, this is a, a major pain uh, that we have to face uh, in practice. Um, all right, let's look at a few more numbers. What what the, what a typical simulation costs? For example, for three D black, binary black holes, how many grid functions do we need? How many functions which are defined at every grid point do we need? A okay, grid function is simply an array which has a value at each grid point. So on the order of a hundred or so, um, harmonic uh, of a BSS of a BSS in similar number of variables, we had 21 variables. So this is 21 grid functions, but if you use Runge 4, you have to store four time levels, and it gives you about 80. There's always some extra ones which you use for some analysis, for the parent horizon, for other things. So in, in total, you have on the order of 100 functions that you have to store at every single grid. Okay? Which is, for example, if you, if you know more about computer hardware, you, you will know this is a serious problem because um, on your chip, you don't have enough in information to store for 100 numbers, all right? So what you actually have to do during the cal calculation, calculate something, forget about it, get some new data, maybe recalculate some numbers because you didn't have enough space on the, on the CPU to, to store all the information. So that, that is this um, constant back and forth because you don't have enough storage. That's why your code may be slow. Um, how many... How many grid points do you need? That's another question. So well, how how you judge this? Well, essentially, it's a good idea to just plot all the variables that you have. All right, just remember here we have a nice. Huh? So um, you know, you plot your. Let's say now this is your apparent horizon, for example. All right, uh, you just you just plot all the variables and just check where do I need a lot of resolution for this. All right, just go through all the 21 variables and check which where at where the resolution. What, what you basically will find is that there's some variables in BSSN, it's these gammas, these const contracted Christoffel symbols, and also the shift components which move the thing across the grid, that they look ugly. They look something like, roughly, roughly they look like this. So in just a 1D projection, they look like that, okay? So they have, in, well, roughly where the black hole is, they have very sharp features. Uh, in fact, a little bit larger. So, so how would you choose your grid now? If you see this grid function, well, maybe you would say, okay, my finest box has to be somewhere there, has to include all the really sharp features, and once I have them safely contained, and here I have maybe a coarser box. 
Okay, so usually, for example, what we do is that the radius of this box is about 50% larger than the radius of the horizon, something on this order. Okay. And then you can, be, you can basically say, okay, in order to resolve these features, like how many points do I need so that this really looks nicely resolved? And the answer is you need at least maybe 30 or 40 or so, otherwise the whole, you're just not completely not capturing the... Um, the profile, and your black hole is just going to flow apart. Okay, the, the the feature just dissolves. Uh, usually, a high resolution, usually high resolution production simulations we use like 80 cubed, 100 cubed. So let's make this simple: about 100 cubed. We usually need. So we have, you have seen in the movie this refinement levels. We may need 10, maybe sometimes 15 refinement levels. Let's say 10 refinement levels. So now you can grid function at one point. This is one double precision number. You can compute how many double precision numbers you have with 100 cubed boxes and 100 grid functions. You get on the order of 100 gigabyte. Okay? You need about 100 gigabyte to store one time step. All right? One full time step in the one quota. So uh, you will need at least, so for one simulation, you will need at least one Cluster, I mean, cluster, which core has maybe two, four gigabytes. Usually, sometimes you have luxury eight. So you need several cores. You will need some small compute cluster to do such, to do one uh, production simulation. Um, so if you, but if you now use several cores, you have to split your simulation over several processors. And the start, there are many ways of doing it. The simplest one is. Computational domain over blocks, and then different cores work on different of these blocks. Let's let's just draw this here. What, although I think I have it on the next slide. Let's see. Do I have this here? No. Oops. We got the drawing. So this is this is my computational grid. Whatever my fine grid here with all the grid lines. And so on, I make different blocks. So here I make four blocks. This one, this one, these two. All right? And so each has its own, each, each has its own grid point, and it's designed to fit into one core. Now the problem is, of course, that as a step but forward in time, uh, information changes here, information changes here, and I have to update the information. So then, I, so then each of these blocks has to communicate with the other ones and has to let them know what has changed. Um, so I have to send this information over the network of the cluster, and that can also be slow, depending on what network uh, you have installed. How long is this going to take? So now um, we, can, we can roughly calculate. So you have basically one, or you have a few evaluations for each grid function at each time level. Let's say maybe on the order of 2, 10 or so. And so now you can make a, a quick estimate of how many operations you have to do in total for one full time step. And then so a typical CPU maybe has 3 gigahertz. And so then you get on the order of maybe a second per step. All right. Now we, have, we had 100 points to cover the black hole region. So the horizon size is roughly 1m. So you compute your, your delta t, and now you can compute whatever, 1,000m of evolution, which would be a few orbits. How long does it take? Well, this is extremely simple calculation, about a day. This is, this is roughly what we have to spend. Okay? So this kind of typical numerical relativity simulations, if it's not extremely high spins or some other fancy stuff, roughly a day or so, a few days maybe for a few hundred m of evolution with memory requirements of on the order of 100 gigabytes or, or significantly more depending on what accuracy you require. So up, up to a factor of a few or so, you can make a simple argument of how much this is going to cost. Um, all right. I think I don't want to say too much about um, Technical things of, of um, parallel. And in order to do the, the communication between the processors, basically, two main 
all the message passing so that the different processes they ex explicitly tell each other, they send each other messages. I have an update. I on my bar, the, this blog it has changed by so much. I send you this message, basically like email each other. Uh, this is um, and the standard uh, framework software for this is is a language is called MPI. You can use MPI with C and Fortran. Who who, who knows MPI? Has anybody programmed MPI before? It's, it's basically it's a, it's a bit. It's not it's not too uh, complicated, but you have to. For example, you see here call MPI receive, and then there's a split message sending this message to specific processors or to all the processors. Then you have to say, you know, the different processors they make a local block. Then of course, then they send each other messages. Then they all have to wait together before doing the next step. Okay, so basically parallelizing with with MPI, you have. You're 100 processors, you have 100 helpers. The 100 helpers are going to do exactly what you tell them, but you have to really exactly tell them what to do, otherwise there's going to be complete chaos and who does what. All right? This is the problem of... Um, uh, I can't access the same memory, so this is the problem of uh, doing this with MPI. There's another technique um, where basically you assume, either real or, or, or faked, that all of these cores, all these workers, at least they access the same memory. So you don't have to explicitly tell them, here is some new data, work with that. They can all access the same memory. Um, for example, if you have these modern CPUs, maybe they have 20 or 40 cores which access the same memory, maybe you can fit your NR simulation into one of these fat, big fat uh, CPUs. They all access the same memory. You don't have to send these messages. It's much, much easier to um, parallelize. And the standard uh, software for doing this is something which is called OpenMP. And um, simple instructions in your code, which has to execute this line in parallel. You compile it for 10 processes, and then the 10 processes will say, hello, 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 hello. Uh, you don't have to explicitly send messages, but you just direct um, Everything with these relatively simple uh, um, statements. All right, let's not talk about scaling. I want to talk about um, what, yeah, what computational infrastructure there is. Now you've heard all this theory and you say, I want to do numerical RTD. Um, what should I do? It's very good to in reinvent the wheel a little bit, to start from the beginning and do some simple exercises all by yourself. That you understand how does it really work, okay? But if you want now to solve a really complicated problem in 3D, there is no need to reinvent the wheel uh, completely, and there's a lot of software available, mostly for free, or sometimes not completely for free, but you can get it from collaborators, which is already done, and uh, which you can use. I think one, if you really want um, to start, I think one good thing is to have your own homegrown uh, 1D code, maybe really, so starting, for example, from the wave equation, to have a scalar field which is coupled to gravity, where you st study collapse and black holes. This is relatively easy to do. You learn a lot uh, doing some project like that. Um, what programming language you, you, you use? Well, if it's a big project, all of them are done in C, C++, Fortran. Fortran at least 90, not Fortran 77, because this is what you will require in the end for speed. Uh, you will, if, you, if you're really serious, you also have to use um, um, commercial optimizing compilers like Intel compilers, not GCC, because they also get much, much faster. They compile much slower because they do a lot of optimization work, but it go, uh, they're much faster. For analyzing the data, or if you just have a smaller project, then there are options which are much, much simpler. So many of you are uh, familiar with MATLAB, Python, uh, Mathematica. I'm all, all, so our, our big production codes that you see of Fortran, but all the analysis, which is mostly what I'm doing, is reading analysis of the results. I do all of this in Mathematica. Um, all right. And a few other things. I will talk about this afterwards. If you want to do um, tensor calculations, for example, to derive your own 3 plus 1 decomposition or some complicated formulation of the Einstein equations or other things, the state of the art, many of you probably know this, 
is this exact suit of uh, computer algebras based on Mathematica for all kinds of um, uh, tensor calculations. This is written by a, a friend uh, that he's now working from Spain. He's now working for Wolfram. If you, if you want to do serious 3D work, you will probably also need some 3D visualization, which, is, which is, can do large data sets, which goes beyond MATLAB. Uh, or, or Mathematica, and so VTK is a, a, a graphical visualization programming language which many tools are based on. Uh, here's a list of various codes and tools that you can download. Uh, so, so there's the uh, Cactus Computational Toolkit, which is some kind of general framework, which has now been, I don't know, I don't know why, why, why I uh, did it like this, which is basically has been absorbed in some other tool which is the Einstein Toolkit, which the Einstein Toolkit is basically a lot of application codes which, which use this uh, computational infrastructure. I got, I got an email this morning from Bruno Giacomazzo. He just put a, a very nice tutorial that you can execute in the Jupyter Notebook. He put this on this web page. Uh, this, has, this, has, this, this code is used by many groups. It has a very uh, large user base and I would say friendly user base. So for example, if you want to do some NR simulation, you download the code, there's a user mailing list, and that there's at least once a month, there's a mail which says, I'm a new PhD student, uh, try the code, it doesn't compile, and then people are quite friendly and they, you know, they help you figure out uh, what your problem is. There are other ones which are available, for example, HAD is kind of similar. Uh, I think Luis is using it, maybe he tells you about it um, next week. SPEC is basically the one code which uses spectral methods to evolve uh, black holes. BAM is something which I use, but unfortunately it's private. It's not available on the, on the web. There's a nice tool for, for example, very uh, sophisticated microphysics in spherical symmetry for people that are more in like, things like supernovas, this kind of stuff. Um, I think I've said one, most of these things. Oh, it, um, maybe one, one comment to make is, so all the, I think all the codes, uh, these big codes for black holes and neutron stars, they do very complicated equations, and all of these codes, they use some kind of code generation to, to actually generate the code from Mathematica or Python, whatever. Um, Einstein Toolkit mostly uses this thing, which, uh, which I wrote a long time ago, <laughs> but now, now it's, uh, it's got a bit complicated. We'll have to simplify it, um, and there are other ones, uh, which I'll include in this of approaches. So there's a one that's uh, something which a guy called Zach Etienne did. Uh, he called it uh, center simple efficient numerical what did he call it? And it's also for free. And it uses it makes a big point of uh, code generation in and it also it uses some new methods of basically trying to replace mesh refinement but just manipulating your coordinate systems, which is quite attractive in GR. Uh, there's a very, very interesting, t entirely new method which uses wavelets. So, so you're not expanding your in standard spectral basis, but in wavelets. That seems quite interesting. And there's a lot of work going on in the community using different versions of um, like lurkin methods, uh, which are supposed to give you very high accuracy for um, fluid dynamics. There's one, one thing if you do real performance computing, you know. This Top 500 sites. So this is all the lists of the biggest machines in in the world. Uh, it gets updated twice a year. This it's quite of interesting. Lots of statistics that you can look at. I, I was browsing this a little bit. One, one statistic. So if you would have gotten this plot of what are, what are the uh, operating systems of the top 500 machines 10 years ago, but even five years ago, you would have seen all kinds of operating systems. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> so this makes this makes it a lot easier. Um, but if you want to do, for example, if you want to do computational work, it's basically some flavor of uh, Unix, which are, the two flavors have survived, which is Linux or the Unix that uh, Max run. But all the big machines, they are all running Linux, without any uh, exceptions. All right. So now I have a few more slides here. Just a few more things. So, uh, so the, the, these slides I call them, I call them bridging the wall between uh, NR and gravitational wave data analysis. So this this is what it felt like about 2007 or so, when people could evolve black holes, but there was not yet contact between gravitational 
waves, and and uh, this is one of the most uh, satisfying, I think, and fulfilling things. If you 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 are working in some scientific community, and then it turns out that there's uh, actually very there's a lot to gain by working with people from an entirely different <laughs> scientific community, and that can be initially very frustrating because you just don't talk, uh, understand that at all. Uh, but maybe after a few years, um, new things develop, and so one of, well, some of the biggest breakthroughs in you know, modeling, modeling gravitational waves come precisely because the analysts, numerical relativity people, post-Napoleon people, you people that actually have really talked to each other, have really worked to each other, went out into new and uh, strange lands and came up with new ideas. Now, um, Rodrigo, he's not here, he told me that I should make some advertisement. So um, here's the advertisement book. Um, so we will for students. Of course, this is just our, our group in Spain. You see, they're all friendly people. They're all very happy here. Um, like, like the Beatles crossing here, but, but we are too many. Too many. Uh, we also we send, we send students to the site, in fact, to the LIGO sites. Uh, we have uh, web pages, and we have a Facebook and Twitter, and all these things. Um, we're always very happy to, uh, if, if people are, are interested. We're not, we're not very rich, um, but sometimes we have some money. So, so um, uh, the, way that the, the way that it always works is that if you're interested, for example, maybe interested, send us an email, say, I would like this or that, and um, do you have and, and probably the answer is that we don't have money now, but, but, if we, but maybe we get some money next few months, and then, then we'll get back to you. Um, no, this is what it looks like. Uh, since this is an advertisement break, I can show some pictures. And um, and this is so. This is I I, I just added this before because it was, was amusing. So we also have classes. We have classes about uh, GR and so on. In fact, so my wife gave a class on on waves this morning, and this is these are the lecture notes that my daughter took. So you see, uh, GC is one. We have the wave equation. So this is. You know, this is what we do in our classes, and yeah, then some more material. Oh, now we have three. Minutes. So maybe just this slide. If you want, if you want to um, get involved with gravitational wave data analysis, modeling, and so on, I think the most exciting thing is to really do something which contributes to um, to the observations. And there's a lot of there's a lot of bigger efforts that you can join. It's not necessarily you know, good science requires a large effort with many, many, many people. It's just one person sitting in the room for a while. But I mean, there's now a lot of um, opportunity to get involved with other things. There's, there's some grayed out, big community projects, with, which are grayed out because they're all older. Um, but these are ongoing things. For example, there are several communities in American city which are uh, organized around some particular code. Yeah, success collaboration, toolkit, band code. Um, you you have some here. You know, can get involved. You you might uh, get involved with one of these uh, communities. Similarly, for way way from modeling, you have seen this before. So there's the EUB community. There's the people that we do phenom modeling. There's this community of doing Poisson-Tonian calculation. The uh, community that does um, effective as um, extreme mass ratio in spirals. So what you've heard about last week, uh, self-force calculations, they, they all need people, and be about people that want to get involved with them. If it goes to uh, modeling, th modeling for applications in the experiments, in LIGO Virgo, there's, so there's the Compact Binary Coalescence Waveform Group, which is basically all the people that do Compact Binary Waveform in um, modeling in, in LIGO and Virgo. There's a Supernova Group, which basically does the same thing first analysis for supernovas. And there's this new collaboration, which are basically is just springing up now. I mentioned this one, the ELISA Consortium. There's also the Einstein Telescope uh, collaboration, so future third generation um, uh, detectors on the ground. Again, this is something which is basically starting now. If you search for Einstein Telescope, you can sign a letter of intent, which is basically you, send a, you say, yes, I'm very interested. And then they'll put you on your mailing list, and you know what's going on. And eventually, the idea is that this also develops into a, a big collaboration where you can, where it's, you know, you can get in early, 
and shape uh, the future. Now, I'm not sure if there's anything else left. Data products, Osmo theory. I think that's we're done. Questions? Questions, suggestions, any other things you want to say now? Otherwise, I'm available in the, in the lunch break, in the coffee break. Um, then I take off. Any more questions? No, we're hungry. All right, let's go. Let's go to eat.